what is growth? It's often quite it's easier to think about what growth is if you think about what growth isn't. So I'm going to start with a slightly possibly controversial point. Growth is not the same as growth hacking. So growth hacking is an amazing book. It's a really useful toolkit. But if you only think of growth hacking when you think about growth, then you're basically going to wait until you've got product market fit, however you define that, until you do anything. Whereas actually what I think is you should start thinking about growth basically from day one. Um, Growth is just existing. So Ben Lewis um, came to see us a couple of weeks ago. We had a really interesting chat about different ways of thinking about growth. Uh, ben is a serial entrepreneur. He is the founder of Airtots, which if any of you have children and travel a lot, is a really amazing service. And also BAM, which is a growth agency for startups. Um, growth is just existing. So as a startup, you don't, you don't have the luxury of waiting until you've got product market fit before you start trying to grow because you need people using your service from day one because otherwise you're not going to get to product market fit. Uh, I'm going to build on that slightly and say that growth is just learning. So the focus of early growth is just getting enough customers on your product to start learning about what it is, about what it should be, about what people actually want and what people will actually pay for. Um, having said that, Growth is about more than just customer numbers. So I think it's really easy to think of growth equals marketing. But actually, when you grow, you're growing more than just the number of people using your service. Polly's going to talk about this, hopefully, more uh, in more detail and more eloquently than I am. But uh, growth is about balance. You, need to, you do need to grow your customer numbers. You need to get people using your product. But you also need to grow your product. So it's all about feedback loops. On day one, you have no product. You've basically got nothing especially as a beta business, you have, you have no product, you have no team, uh, you've got no customers. What you do have is buy-in from some senior stakeholders that the opportunity area you've identified is a thing. So that's day one. By day 10, you've done a bit of research, you've thrown up a landing page, you've got a team to work on your product with you, and you've got three customers using or signing up to your landing page. And that's probably your mum, your dad, maybe your boss if you're lucky. Um, that's still growth. And what you've done is you've grown more than just the numbers. You've grown, you've grown your product, you've grown your team, you've grown your organisation. You're kind of on that road, you've already started. But I think the most important thing, I will say this evening, is that um, it's about balance. You c if, you get, if you lose track of any of those things, the whole thing will fall apart. You grow your customer numbers too quickly, they'll just leave because your product is essentially a bit shit. If you grow your product too quickly, then you'll end up building loads of stuff that you don't need because then when customers start using it, they'll be like, well, we don't need that, we don't need that, we don't need that. And if you grow your team too quickly, it'll be super expensive to run and really inefficient. So that balance is, is super important. So I've already said that early growth is about getting enough customers on your product to learn about your product. So um, Michael Siebel uh, of Stripe and Twitch and Y Combinator So just get anyone using your product. And I would add to that, the faster you can get to the point that they're not related to you by blood or <laughs> working in the same place or, or whatever, the better, because those customers are probably lying to you. Um, for, uh, for John Lewis, when we did the pilot for that, we started with a free pilot because there wasn't really a product there. We had some bits of kit. We had some things that we wanted to test. So we started a free pilot. We asked uh, friends and family of employees if they wanted to sign up for it. And then we picked the people that were that fit some very basic criteria that made that they were, they were eligible. But we got them using it, even though it didn't really exist. So for three months, we got feedback from them, we got data from them that we wouldn't have had if we'd waited till we'd built it. Um, we learned a massive amount, but also we, it enabled us to build the product around them. Um, which brings me on to feedback loops. So I've already said growth is about, it's about learning. The only way you can learn about your product or about your customers is to listen to them. So um, you need to get the flow of information between your customers, the people who are designing and building your product, and the product itself, so that you can make the changes quickly enough to actually learn and then see the changes that that's made. It's not So the data itself, the data that you get from a product, is super important. And if you're not collecting the right data, then you're kind of already shooting yourself in the foot. But also, 
kind of get up close and personal to them. It's easier with some products than others. With B2B products, it's super easy because you're probably calling them anyway to talk to them about their problems, the things that they need, whether they should buy your service in the first place. But make sure that you're getting proper feedback from your customers really, really regularly. And that's true of everybody. Um, so how many customers should you be talking to at this stage? According to Stripe, you need 10. Um, and that doesn't sound like very many to build a product around. But they make an interesting point that 10, 10 happy customers, so 10 unhappy customers is, is kind of a different issue. If you have 10 happy customers, that's enough people to prove that you're onto a good thing. It's unlikely to be a complete fluke if you've got 10 happy customers. But it's also few enough that you can hear the stories that they're telling you. So the data that you're getting, the feedback that you're getting, if you've got 10 people, you're going to get really, really good quality data that you can actually listen to and act on and then grow from that point. Uh, Alex Schultz from Facebook. Uh, if you're a startup, you shouldn't have a fucking growth team. His point is partly about um, efficiency and cost and that idea of not having a blown out team size, but it's also about your product team should be the people who are talking to your customers all the time. So Airbnb's Brian Chesky's famously, he's famous for, in the early days, he used to just rock up at hosts' houses and ask if he could come in and have a chat. Most of them thought it was a bit creepy. I think in the end, that's why they started offering professional photography. It was nothing to do with the quality of the images. It gave him a reason to be knocking on these people's doors and saying, can I come in? And he talks quite a lot about the people that he spoke to. They gave him amazing insights about the product as it is. Um, one guy, when... <laughs> When he left, he gave him a, a basically a binder full of notes about what he thought Airbnb should be, and that basically formed their roadmap for the next few months. Um, Smarty, when f Smarty first launched, um, the customer support team was the product team. So, uh, as Sai said earlier, it was a um, digital customer support. So they weren't on the phones; they were on intercom. But by keeping them doing that job. It meant that the feedback that was coming in from the customers didn't have to be logged somewhere and then communicated to somebody else and then passed down the line. It meant that feedback went direct to the people that were making the decisions about the product. And I think that worked until there were about 1,000-ish people on, on Smarty. Um, Paul Graham, who James talked about earlier, coined the term about doing things that don't scale. So having the product team on Smarty being the customer support team is not at all scalable. You get to the point where you have a few hundred people and all of a sudden the product team are spending all their time answering questions and not actually any time making decisions about product. Doing things that don't scale is a really, really good thing to do in the early days because you can. So kind of do those things, get really close to your customers while you have the opportunity to because further down the line, you're not going to be able to do that. Well, you might... Uh, what's the uh, Walmart dude? Sam. Sam. Founded Walmart. Um, he used to just drive around in the delivery trucks so that he could meet the people that they were doing the deliveries to till, like, till he was in his 80s. He needed to know that he was still getting that kind of really, really upfront customer focus. Um, chasing the first thousand customers. So this is, uh, I think this is very much a, a beta business issue. So some of these things are true for startups and beta businesses. As a startup, you're still going to be chasing those numbers. You really care about getting your first 10 customers, your first 100 customers, your first 1,000 customers. But actually, they don't really make any difference as long as you've got enough money to survive for the next week, month, however long you need to survive. Um, they're just nice milestones. As a beta business, you're quite often having to answer to specific, uh, specific expectations from the parent business that are quite often numbers-focused. So sometimes that's revenue, sometimes it's customer numbers. And actually, they're kind of the wrong things to focus on in the early days, because what you should be focusing on is learning and proof that the thing that you're doing is a really good thing to do. So I think rather than chasing a specific set of customers, you need to focus more on what are we trying to learn, where are we trying to get to, what's that star that we're going to follow, and make sure that the, the thing that you're following is actually something that's going to be valuable to your business. Having 1,000 customers in three months isn't going to help you build a sustainable business because you're going to learn more from those first 10 than you will from the next 990. Also, as a caveat to that, if you've got the kind of business that you launch on, what, so gaming, for example, you launch a new game, if you don't have 1,000 customers by the end of the week, 
it's probably the wrong game. So all of these numbers are different by industry. But uh, yeah, chasing, chasing numbers just for the sake of numbers isn't really very good for anybody. Um, fall in love with your early adopters. So uh, I think James touched on this a little bit with Smarty. Um, everything we do is customer focused. That's, that's kind of the whole ethos of, of the way that we work. But I think we still often don't quite get tight enough. Um, we'll have a sense of who our target audience is, but actually knowing who the people are going to be that are going to, they're going to buy into that when it's still a little bit half-baked. The customer service is a bit scrappy. There's not really any sense of where it's going. The roadmap doesn't exist. You need to find those people because they're the people who, either because they're serial early adopters and they just like being first, or because the problem you're solving for them is so intense that they will do anything to help you get this product out there. So getting to know who those people are and finding those people is really important. Um, as a general rule, and this is probably a made-up statistic, um, if you ask a bunch of people who fall into your target audience if they want to use your service in the first few weeks, probably most of them will say no. The one in ten that say yes, they're your early adopters. They're the ones who are excited enough about it to give it a punt. And they're the people who you need to design your whole business around. Um, as a beta business, one of the things that you have that startups don't have is often access to a whole bunch of customers and channels to reach them through. So for John Lewis, Standard Life, a little bit for Smarty. Um, we, we targeted existing employees or customers. Superdrug Mobile as well. Um, it's a really good shortcut. If, if the people that you already have fall into the target of the people that you're looking for, then it's a, it's a great starting point. For some of the uh, triggers for beta businesses, it might be that you want to reach a totally different customer base, in which case you actually have to go out and find these people. Um, how do you find them? So again, it sort of depends on your product. If it's a B2B product, just get on the phone and ring some people because actually there's not really anything better than cold hard sales. So getting 10 businesses signed up to your business really, really early is going to set you up in a really good situation. If it's consumer, then um, stick £250 on a Facebook ad, go and hang out on community sites. The community sites is also true for businesses. You can get a really long way without spending money on what would traditionally be considered as marketing. The only thing I do know about SEO is you need to start it really, really early. So in week one, two, as soon as you know kind of where you're playing, you should start thinking about how you're going to get Google to help you on your journey. Because Google can be a really good friend, or it can just leave you in the cold. Um, fall in love with your data. There's a lot of love in this talk. Uh, so in the early stages, so I've said you should start with probably 10 people. Find 10 people any way you can. From that point on, you should be seeing weekly growth. Um, 5 to 7% is a good rate. We're not talking like massive epic growth here. It's just building on that target week on week. You can see that you're doing well. If you're not doing well, the data is going to tell you that. And the data is going to tell you that you need to change something. And almost always, what you should change is not your marketing or your messaging. You should change your product. So if people aren't finding you in the first place, you should think about your distribution channels. Are you in the right place? On the Smarty front as well, are you going after the right customers? You thought you knew what your target audience was. Actually, the people that have used Smarty um, aren't the people that we thought were going to use Smarty. People are getting to your product, but then they're not signing up then go back and think about your messaging, because obviously you're, you're not selling it well enough. And actually, I think that's one of the things that we've learned in probably the last six months that we need to get much better at really quickly, is actually the, we're great at designing products. We're less good at the kind of, how you package them up to sell them in the first place. Um, if people are signing up and then they're just disappearing, they're just dropping off the radar, then there is a problem with your product. So whether it's, too expensive, it's not, it, the, the cost of it isn't giving them the value that they want to get from it. It's too hard to use. They've just realized that actually that problem wasn't that bad in the first place. Go back to your product, fix those things, and then start looking at growth again. It's again, it's all about balance. Um, three slash two engines of growth. 
Does everybody know what the three engines of growth is? Has anybody heard of it? So Eric Ries in the Lean Startup came up with the three engines of growth, which are stickiness or retention, virality and paid. So this isn't, this isn't meant to be provocative. There are actually loads of blog posts out there saying there are only two engines of growth. But I have a slightly different point on it, which is I think in the early phase, you only really need to think about retention and virality. And if you nail those two, again, as Smarty has kind of demonstrated, spending money on paid isn't necessarily going to be the thing that gets you where you want to go. Um, retention. Stopping people leaving once you've got them. So the good thing about retention is you have everything you need within your product and your product team to totally nail retention. If you're listening to the data, you can find out why people are leaving. If you're talking to customers, you can find out where they're leaving. Um, it's really quite straightforward as long as you're paying attention. Constantly optimizing, even once you've got loads of customers using it. Just keep thinking about that retention. And similarly, virality. Um, if you've got the right product, your customers will want to talk about it. They'll want to tell their friends. You just need to build in the things that will help them along their way. So whether that's referrals, which have been super successful for Smarty. I am a Smarty customer. If anybody would like a referral code, <laughs> I have one. Um, I distracted myself then. Uh, referrals, golden tickets, super interesting content, things that will, that will help your customers tell their friends and their networks about your product. And that's really all you need to do. If you've put those things in place and they aren't telling their friends and their colleagues about your product, then again, go back to your product because there's probably something in your product that means that they don't want to talk about it. Um, so just to recap before I go on to uh, scaling, um, what have I covered? Growth is a mindset. It's not, it's not a phase. And actually, that's something I wanted to say about James. The beta business process, which James showed earlier, very definitely shows set up, discovery, go to market, grow as a phase. Grow is not a phase. But as James also said, it's an evolution. So that's my latest thing. Of In the process of writing this, it's made me realize that actually we need to change that bit. Um, sorry, other things I covered. It's all about balance. So keeping things in balance is the best way to um, grow a sustainable business. Um, don't chase the wrong numbers, so make sure that actually the things that you're chasing are the things that you should be chasing, and listen to the data. So preparing to scale. So you're a little bit further down the line, you've got happy customers using your product, you're pretty certain that your product is getting to where it needs to be. There's so much conversation about what product market fit means that I just... I mean, where would you even start? But you need to know that if I did put some money behind this now, I'm basically not filling a leaky bucket. So any money I spend is going to go on a product that is reasonably, I'm reasonably happy with where it's going. The feedback I'm getting from my customers is that it's a good thing and that, it values, that they value it. Stop thinking like a team and start thinking like a business. Um, so I don't actually mean this. I think that you, you obviously still have to think like a team. Thinking like a team is the thing that's going to get you through the patch in James's diagram where everything tanks. You can't remember why you did it in the first place and you hate your job. But this is a really good point before you hit that scale button to think about how you design the business of the future. So Uber recently laid off hundreds of people because they scaled so quickly, they didn't think about how to grow their business. And they ended up with <coughs> organizational structure that didn't really work quite a lot of people that actually they just wanted to get rid of a fairly toxic culture. So they're trying to fix that now, but actually if they'd put those things in place at the beginning, it would have been way easier for them. And this is the point before you hit that button that, um, that you should think about those things. And I'm hoping that uh, Polly's going to talk about that in the panel. Um, forget your early adopters. They're rubbish. Uh, I said that you should fall in love with them. And you should for a brief period. But as I also said, your early adopters are probably one in 10 of your target audience. So you can only scale so far if that's who you're talking to. So you could just hit the button, spend loads of money, get more people to come to your product. But you've designed that product around a bunch of people that don't really care if it's a bit rubbish as long as it solves their problem. They quite like hacky, beatery type things because that's the way they are. And uh, they would just 
They were the right people at the right point in time. If you suddenly bring a load of people to that, they're going to say, but this is rubbish. The user experience is terrible. The customer service doesn't work. The product's a little bit half-baked. What you need to do at this point is go, OK, these are my early adopters. This is my target audience. I think the technical term is this is my early majority. Uh, what do I need to do to my product to get it fit for these people so that I can then hit the button, turn all of the floodlights on, and then bring, bring the masses to my product? Which just brings us on to hitting the button. So I actually don't know if you ever need to do this. In terms of spending a massive amount of money on traditional marketing, whether that's TV advertising, radio, in enormous billboards, there are so many products that have grown to really, really good scale with just retention and good virality. Sometimes you need a little bit of a boost. Um, and also, it's, it is totally worth experimenting. So this is the stage where you need to get your growth hacking book out. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about it. Read the book. It's really good. Um, the basic premise is do lots of small experiments to understand what is going to work for your product because it will be a different marketing mix, it will be different channels, it will be different messages for every product. This is also, um, from a beta business perspective, where there's quite a big difference. So most beta businesses are spun out of companies that have big marketing teams and external agencies and a lot of experience. So as a beta business, you can draw on some of that which brings with it huge benefits and also really, really big challenges. Depending on the situation, how you play that will be very different. It goes back to the sliders that James showed at the beginning of how, how separate do you want to be. Our experience so far, we've had the most success when we've involved those marketing people really early, but, but tried very hard to not get too sucked into being... You're a tiny, tiny cog in a massive marketing machine. So to size point, the budgets that Smarty have compared to the budgets that the, the big guys have and even that three have, the, that doesn't buy very much attention from an overworked marketing person. <coughs> so actually, you're probably better off sh kind of shielding yourself a little bit from the, from the glare of that um, marketing empire. Uh, so how many of you have heard of Beauty Pie? I'm actually going to become a beauty pie sales rep because I love them so much. So for those of you that don't know about it, uh, Marcia Kilgore founded Fitflop and Bliss Spas and Soap and Glory. She's amazing. She founded Beauty Pie as a way of basically disrupting the beauty industry. So it's a, a membership scheme. You pay a membership fee and then you get access to buy cost price cosmetics. Because her point is, why should you be paying for the packaging, the hype, the brand? For, uh, I can't think of a single famous person. Jennifer Lopez's face to be on your makeup. If that, if that floats your boat, then fine. But why should everybody be paying for that? So um, Beauty Pie's been going for a couple of years. They've got, it's slight, slightly unclear how many customers. Tens of thousands is the most specific I could get to. Um, they've done no advertising. It's, they've grown to that scale purely with retention and virality. And as she says here... She's slightly nervous about hitting that button because they already have problems where they sell out of everything. They've really got to get a fix on um, their inventory stuff, on how they distribute stuff, how they get the... One of the problems they have is getting the right packaging because uh, their packaging is very stripped back and very bare, but they still have to get it. So she can get the product, but she can't get the packaging, or she can get the packaging, but not the product, blah, blah, blah. She needs to work all of that out before she can start bringing people to Beauty Pie. The other thing that she's uh, endearingly honest about is that the Beauty Pie website experience is a bit shit. So they did some testing, and one in 11 people in their testing could get from the landing page to a shopping cart and check out, which is actually fine, because one in 11 is probably your early adopters. They're going to find their way through, because they really want those products. Um, but that's not enough to get her the scale that she wants. She's talked about her ambition for this being millions of people globally, but she's at that situation now where they've got a massive amount of people using it and talking about it, and their viral growth has been great. But she, she, wants, to, she wants those millions. She's going to have to 
prepare to scale. And so that's the point that they're at at the moment, is trying to work out how, how they get from their early adopter product into their early majority product without pissing everybody off, selling out of everything and losing all the customers she has. Um, one final comment is that I also have a beauty pie referral code if anybody would like to join beauty pie. <laughs> so um, three things I think you should remember. Um, it's all about balance. Don't, don't scale too fast. Don't scale your team too fast. Uh, don't grow your product too fast. Just, you know, do a little bit of each. It's, it's a beautiful circle. Uh, listen to the data, and by that I don't just mean digital data, I mean things that people can tell you, things that you can learn just by observing people. That data is your friend, and you are, that's the best way to grow everything in your organization. And then the third point is to reset your product before you scale, because otherwise you are going to spend that marketing money that you've hard won by begging it from the parent ship to start with, and it's just going to force you into a hole. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.